गुरुर्विष्णु गुरु देवो महेश्वर गुरुर्व परम ब्रह्मा तस्मा श्री गुरव नम चिन्मय व्याप्यत्सर्वैलोक्यम सचराचर तत्पद दर्शिता तस्मा श्रीवे नम वेदमाता बंधु सखा वेद्यामेव सर्व मम देव सर्व मम सहना सहना सह वीर्यम खरवाजस्वी नामधीतमस्तु मिशावहाई ओ शांति 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 So welcome to you all. Where are we in our text? Chapter sixteen, number forty-five. Okay. Can you help us out? Yep. Guna nam sam. समभाशो नुपपद्यते अद्यादेह प्रस्तुतवान्यो हेतुरुच्यते The deviation of the gunas from the state of equilibrium which they have during the dissolution of the universe with their consequent evolution is not reasonable for no causes of this transformation are admitted in as much as according to these philosophers uh ignorance is then merged individual souls purushas as they are called are always spectators only and ishvara is not admitted so here shankara is uh arguing against some of the basic principles of sankhya philosophy so sankhya philosophy is an older philosophy than the advaita vedanta it's fundamentally dualistic and it says that there are individual little clumps of consciousness called purushas and they get tangled up in the stuff of matter which is called prakriti and that's our problem our problem is we have to disentangle the individual purusha from the prakriti uh in the yoga sutra the very famous commentator named vyasa it's not the same as veda vyasa it's a much later vyasa who comments on yoga sutra is a sankhya philosopher uh so anyway part of the sankhya philosophy posits that before creation everything is in equilibrium and by the way the the stuff out of which prakriti is made is the three gunas tamas rajas and sat and they're in kind of this state of equilibrium and then they go out of balance and then all of a sudden creation starts to happen 
and what Shankara is saying here, what caused it? What made the gunas move out of equilibrium? What causes the purushas? So he says, the very philosophy implies something prior to the equilibrium of the gunas. And the Sankhya philosophy doesn't deal with that. Now, I don't think it matters too much to you and me. The main point where I would push back on Sankhya philosophy. So Aditi is sitting on the couch. She sees the room from her viewpoint. I see the room from my viewpoint. She's aware of her thoughts and feelings. I'm aware of my thoughts and feelings. She has a karta, an individual knower of the phenomenal world of viewpoint that's different than my viewpoint. But if she quietens her mind and notices the noticer, there is Satchidananda, just the space of pure awareness. When I introvert my attention, I see the same thing. The self in me is not like the self in her. It is the self. So Advaita Vedanta is non-dual. There's only one entity here. Best example I can give of this is imagine I've got a piece of butcher paper in front of you. And in it are six pinholes. And the room is dark. And the pinholes seem to be lighted up. So Aditi over there on the couch sees six lights. The question is, are there six pen lights shining through each one of the pen holes? Pin holes, or is there one flashlight, which then appears as six lights as they peep through the holes? So the prior example, the Sankhya philosophy, the second example is the Advaita Vedanta. It's only one being, which is the ground of being of everyone and everything. Any thoughts on this? So practically speaking, as we meditate, get a sense, okay, I can see that I'm the witness, I can see that I'm the witness, but it still feels like I'm a little glob of consciousness. I hear what you say, Jim, but right now I only take that on faith. I still feel like an individual glob of consciousness. The reason is ignorance is still there. So what do we need to do? Bhairagya, mature dispassion. It is the annihilation of the vasanas here and now that's considered liberation by the wise. When the last attachment is let go of, that sense of individuality, it's gone. So it's a direct experience. The philosophy proceeds from the experience. It's not just, gee, this is a good idea. It's not theoretical. Though. Next verse. Itare tara he tu tue pravritti 
सदानो न प्रवृत्तीना गुणेश्वात्मनि भवेत If the gunas be the cause of their mutual changes there will always be change or none at all if one argues that there cannot be a continuous transformation in the gunas as creation maintenance and dissolution are known to come one after another still there will be no regulating cause of the modifications of the gunas acting either on the purushas or on the gunas and no other categories are admitted in the sankhya philosophy So he just is ripping again on the same idea that you cannot find any primordial cause for the imbalance in the gunas and their effect on the various purushas without positing a primary cause antecedent to them. And Sankhya philosophy doesn't say there is one. Vedanta says. consciousness is eternal consciousness has coexistent with it co-eternal with it it's maya shakti the world is not created the world is imagined it's nobody knows why it's just what is substratum is eternal the mantra we chant at the end of class the purnamada translation is this is full full of what being that is full that which is beyond this world is full of being the fullness of this world has proceeded from as issued forth from the fullness of that out of consciousness waves the phenomenal and when the phenomenal world is dissolved whether it's the big cool or the big crunch we don't know is it all dissolved into a supermassive black hole who knows but the fullness of that still so what for you and me the various dreams of this life or other lives see the track you see so for example are they he used to live in down right that was we could look at it as another incarnation so where did he go but you are the substrate you have a good week take a trip have a lot of fun go dance have a crappy week weather's bad not feeling well conflict in the family something there is that's an eternal substrate that never ever Next verse. Visheshu bhukti, visheshu mukta padan nandat. Arthena cha yujjate, arthati no sattva sampanto, arthi kyo netaro piva. if as admitted the prakriti or, or pradhan work for the bondage and the liberation of the purushas there will be no distinction between the bound and the liberated 
Moreover, there is no relation between what is desired, i.e. liberation, and one who desires it, as the Purusha has no desire at all, neither the other, i.e. the Prakriti. So one of the ideas in the Sakya philosophy is the Prakriti has within it the inherent cause of our bondage and within it the inherent cause of our liberation. Practically speaking, they say, we get all tangled up in matter and then we desire this, that, and the other thing. We get all tangled with it. And then the suffering gets so bad, we develop uh, this passion. We desire to be disentangled. And they say it's the property itself that does that. See, it's, it, there's actually some validity to that. as the result of my spiritual ignorance, I do, as an ego, get entangled in the world. But that entanglement never touches the self. And then finally, as the ultimate response to my suffering, I have subej, auspicious desire. I desire moksha, liberation. I become a mamukshu. Seeker after liberation that occurs in the mind, prakriti. Listen carefully. Bondage and liberation only occur to the mind. The self is ever free. What is self-realization. Self-realization happens. Mind becomes very, very still and quiet. We call this samadhi. Here we call this. And if the attentive faculty is pointed inward, Everything but Aham, I, your being. Then when the mind returns, it remembers. It goes, oh, there's nobody there. We don't become Brahma. We realize that we've always been that. Thought that I was a person was like a very long and very vivid dream. Now, where does that insight in the waking state go at night? But yourself is not God. So there's real knowledge of the self with a capital R. That's the self evidence of I. How do you know you were you? You don't see, hear, taste, touch, smell, emote, or think yourself. Yet you know you are. And that's not the thought, gee, I am. That's another thought. Self is self-evident. It's obvious, self-existent. Undeniable, unnegatable. Listen carefully. Great cosmic joke, spiritual life. Everybody already has it. So what is it that changes? It's not self. It's this deep confusion in the subtle intellect. Vidyana Mayakusha. 
in the Vijnana Maya Kosha is this karta, this doer. What does it do? It attributes to the self the qualities of the not self. Sankhya would say the Purusha itself gets confused. Vedanta says, no. No one ever doubts that they are. They doubt what they are. They do not doubt that they are. Why do we doubt what we are? Because we attribute in the subtle intellect to the self the qualities of the not self. What does investigation do? It untangles that ignorance. I see, oh no, I'm not the body, I'm the knower of the body. I am not the prana, I'm the knower of the prana. I am not the mind, I'm the knower of the feelings of judgments. I am not the buddhi, I'm the knower of thoughts. I'm not even deep sleep, I'm the knower of ignorance. I am never known as an object. I am not unknown. Then the intellect flashes. Oh, yeah. Who is it that gets it? Fundamentally, it This is why the great 20th century saint Meher Baba used to say, everybody has already realized. Don't worry, be happy. Only real self-knowledge. But, that's a big but. The problem is my mind. So, it is of value for the mind that's in the state of ignorance to move into the state of jnana, knowledge. There's indirect knowledge, parochi jnana, gained through the scripture, gained from the teacher. But then you meditate, inquire into yourself. You'll see, you'll have aparochyana, direct experience. I am that part of this brother. Shankara thunders, Jidananda. This consciousness. Because when the mind ceases its extroversion, its craving, Oh, I becomes this Sometimes I think all the technical stuff of Vedanta is just something to occupy the intellect while the unconscious just unloads. Next verse. Pradhana Sirchu Paradham Purusha Syavi Garataha Nayuktam Sankhya Shastrepi Vikarepi 
Yuchate. As the Purusha is changeless, it is not reasonable, according to the Sankhya philosophy also, that the Prakriti can work for it. Even admitting change it in the Purusha, it is unreasonable that the Prakriti is of any service or disservice to it. Yes. So the fundamental distinction between spirit and matter. Does this matter affect the spirit or does it not affect the spirit? Does the Purusha, does the individual change? Does the Purusha have will? Does the Purusha have choice? This is certainly the Western idea of the soul. Now, why is he banging on all this Sankhya philosophy? There's a good reason. The language of the Sankhya philosophy is what Vyasa uses in the Bhagavad Gita, although he redefines a lot of these terms. For example, we'll have one whole chapter that's called Purushottama Yoga. Uttama Purusha. Now, the Iskan people translate this as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, ultimate person, Krishna, up there. And the little person, he's a big person. <laughs> but I translate it differently. What is the ultimate essence of personness? Purusha just means person. It's ancient. One of the oldest hymns in the Rig Veda, one of the earliest pieces of literature in the whole world that we know of, is called the Purusha Sutka. Do you know this hymn? Do you know of it? I've heard of it. Yeah. And it describes the supreme person in anthropomorphic terms. The sun and the moon are his eyes. His kidneys are the waters, etc. It's all allegory. It's all allegory. But Vyasa, the author of the Gita, takes this language, comes from the Sanjya philosophy, maybe even earlier, and uses it to describe Krishna, which means he's describing himself. Now, out of consciousness, waves mind stop. Mind stop, out of which all of this is made. Prakriti is absolutely a perfectly good word for it. But is Prakriti really separate? From consciousness. Let me give you a real live example. <clears throat> if you close your eyes and visualize an elephant, you have a subject object relationship. I see the elephant. But you cannot find a second substance out of which the elephant is made. <clears throat> now, does my imaginary elephant affect me? Okay, imagine you've got a bull elephant charging you and it's going to stomp on you. <clears throat> now, wait a minute. Was I afraid or was I aware of a frightened mind? Fear is a feeling. So the fear is essentially just another object, just like the elephant. Neither the elephant nor the fear engendered by it really touches me. If I visualize a mouse, doesn't take less of me to visualize. 
and we find in the end time and space can be imagined in the mind. We microcosmically reenact. It looks like to, I see stuff. I cognize stuff, physical objects, feelings, thoughts, memories, images, words, reactions. It looks like to we, but it's not. A uh, Dwight. That's why we call it non duality. Looks like to, but it's not to. Then Krishna and Gita will talk about higher and lower prakriti. The prakriti, like the word nature in English, has two meanings. I want to drive up to Muir Woods and enjoy the beauty of nature, meaning the natural world. Or, oh, there's Jim, he's told an awful dad joke. Yeah, well, that's just his nature, meaning the essence of something, the nature of something. The word nature has two meanings. The word prakriti also has the same two meanings. So what is the nature of the phenomenal world? Name and form. Jagan Mitya, the phenomenal world is it is. But Saravam Kaudi Bhaktivedanta, the phenomenal world is nothing but consciousness. But then Krishna will say, ah, but I have a higher. is birthless and changeless and deathless. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever that the Hebrew scripture describes to God. What you'll find out is it's the truth about Well, why does consciousness seem to have Maya Shakti and all this stuff happens? Is God lonely? Does he do it to dance with himself? Is he evolving? All these various philosophies attribute to divinity, anthropomorphic motivational qualities. It's nonsense. What do we know for sure? It is. It's all that we know. And in Samadhi, in Nirvikopa, where only Aham exists. When the mind returns, one actually watches out of the self the mortal nature property emerges. And then in a blink of an eye, the whole world comes into the hand. These creation myths are really all about mind returning from Samadhi. It's 
it's not just men. It's not just people trying to figure out how the world came about. It's all rooted. Okay, enough of that. Next verse. Sambandhanupapatescha prakrite purushasyacha mitho yuktam tadarthattvam pradhanasya chitte kutaha. As there can reasonably be no mutual relationship, no mutual relation between the prakriti and the purusha, and as the prakriti is non conscious, it is unreasonable that the prakriti can render any service to the purusha. So these ideas that the purusha is that which causes, excuse me, the prakriti is that which causes the purusha to be bound, and it's the prakriti which causes the purusha to become liberated. That's the Sankhya philosophy. Here Shankara is saying it's illogical because the phenomenal world, gross and subtle, is what we call jada, which means inert, insentient. What do we mean by that? So I look at the table. The table is not sentient. It's just the thing. But when I go to the subtle world, one feeling, doesn't know another feeling. One thought doesn't know another thought. With reference to me, all the objects, emotions, and thoughts are inert. They're just objects that are the objects of cognition. The cognition, the knowing, resides with me. I is sentient. What I illumine is inert. Now I look over across the room, the couch, and I see Adi. She doesn't look inert to me. She's a very bright, intelligent, wonderful woman. Well, now let's analyze that. Aditi sees the objects in the room from her viewpoint, subject, object. You know your body with reference to you. Your body is inert. It does not know itself. You know it. But so why should I think it's sentient? Just because it moves doesn't mean it's sentient. Many of you garden and you have good water pressure in your yard. You can turn on the hose and the hose snakes. Or you watch um, a fire hose when they turn on the fire hydrant. You see the fire hose snake. It's moving, but is it sentient? No, it's just inert. It's actually making a sine wave, but it's cut off at the end. Movement does not imply sentience. So it's not even just physical movement. It's mental movement. It's intellectual movement. Where is the sentience? Conscious being peeps out of those eyes. Moves the mind into the mind. Where is it located? It's inside my head. Angita, 
in the early chapters, Krishna says, all this is strung on me like gems on a thread. Oh, that's so nice. Krishna, you, Krishna, me, Krishna, that person. Then later, he says, well, actually, it's not true. I am not in them. They are in me. If I dream about all the people in my family, and I am there in the dream too, having conversations with the people in my family. I can say I am ultimately the self of that dream body and all the characters. But really, I'm not in them. They are in me. They're all contained within the mind. And when I wake up, thank God they're not in bed with me. Because they're not in me. So Krishna says, I am not in them, they are in me. And actually they're not really in me. Behold my divine Maya. Support. Oh. Just like your mind is the support of the whole dream world. So the point that Shankara is driving at here, pushing against the Sankhya philosophy. They're not individual Purushas. There's only one of us here, one entity. Matter is not inherently sentient, although it occurs in sentience. It is none other than consciousness. Though the names and forms are not self luminous. What are the names and forms? Vibration held together by thought. That's all they are. Far more plastic, far more malleable. And the sub is kutusta, still immovable. It's not rise, it's not fall, never really believe it. I'm worried, be happy. Let it go. It'll be okay. Next verse. Priyot, but though. If any action is admitted in the Purusha, it must be perishable. If it is argued that that the action in the Purusha is of the nature of knowledge only, we meet with the difficulties spoken of before. 
If uncaused action in the prakriti be admitted, it becomes unreasonable that there can be liberation. Yes. So the whole point is, if it has a beginning, it has to have an end. If it becomes something, it can be lost. So this is why we say liberation is permanent. Why? Because we are never bound in the first place. I find out what's always Just like I go to sleep at night and I have a terrible dream, then I last. Then I wake up. I meet the waker. Nothing touches. Nothing in the world touches. Don't believe me. Slow down enough. Look. What about these awful feelings I seem to have? They're painful to the mind, yes. Don't worry. They will pass. Always, such is the nature of name and form, it always passes. Oh, Jim, I feel so terrible. Don't worry, it won't pass. Oh, Jim, I'm having such a great time. I'm getting everything I want. Don't worry, it will pass. Everything passes in the world of pain. But you are an eternal factor. The good news is happiness is the mind abiding in that. You are always available. Doesn't mean I always avail myself of it. But I was always there. All I have to do is let go. Not to settle down. Next verse. Prakashim Yathoshnatvam Yane Nevam Sukhadeha Ekanida Pratograhya Suhakar Suhakarnada Devatma Nam Pleasure, etc., cannot be the objects of knowledge, for they are the properties of the same substance, just as heat, a property of fire, cannot be revealed by light. Read that again. Pleasure, etc., cannot be the objects of knowledge, for they are the properties of the same substance, just as heat, a property of fire, cannot be revealed by light. I'm not quite sure what he's driving at. He has a footnote please um oh it's a refutation when he says pleasure etc it's a refutation of karnara's vaish vaishishika doctrine never mind <laughs> i don't think that clarified much 
So one of the things we want to understand is what is pleasure? The person in ignorance thinks the objects of the senses have inherent pleasure. I like chocolate. Pleasure is in the chocolate. Well, I don't like chocolate. I like coffee. Coffee has inherent pleasure. I can't stand coffee. I can pee. I like persimmons. Ugh! Can't stand persimmons. So we find that though everybody has things they like, what we like differs from person to person. The pleasure cannot be an inherent part of the object. It is not like heat and fire. Everybody experiences hot fire. It is not like wetness and water. Everybody experiences wetness and water. So what is it that has happiness as its swadharma, its essential nature? What we discover is that when the mind dances with what it determines to be an object of desire, chocolate, desire and object of desire become one. What happens is the desiring has gone away momentarily. It is the extroverting mind. It is that inherent vichepa shakti that is pain. When that ceases and the mind comes home. Happiness is my svabhava. It's my true nature. It's not an inherent quality. I just use the objects to induce the state of the non craving mind. And this is why meditation is so important. Because I can hear this theoretically, but until I have practiced enough, so that I have objectless happiness. My mind won't believe I hear what you say, Jim. The self is the source of all happiness. But my husband behaving is really <laughs> more important. Good food is really where it's at. Getting what I want is really what it's about. Those things are so limited and so temporary. The world changes, and even more weird, my mind changes. One chocolate is wonderful. I heat, eat the whole jar and I want to barf. One donut, a whole box of them. Such is the nature. If you cultivate this Atmarama, this capacity, drop the world at least for a moment, rather than self. 
the world will leave you. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't get joy out of the things of the world. Of course we do. The Gita has this wonderful metaphor. It's like the waters of a river flowing into the ocean. It's like a thin bowl full of water pouring into the ocean. As the You hear me use this term, the world becomes trinkets and baubles. It's no longer precious in the way that it was before. Ready to look at it. But the mind no longer seriously. Mind and the world is able to block it all. All right, next verse. Yoga Patsa Mavi Tatum Sukhavikshana Yorapi Mano Yoga Kahetutta Pleasure and knowledge cannot come together as each of them is separately caused by the contact of the mind with the self. Therefore, pleasure cannot be the object of knowledge. I have no idea what he means by that. Mm -hmm. Read it again, please, in English. Pleasure and knowledge cannot come together as each of them is separately caused by the contact of the mind with the self. Therefore, pleasure cannot be the object of knowledge. So I think he's saying again that sukham is my swabhava, it's my self nature. It is the same thing as self knowledge. Practically speaking, Tune up together and just drop the mind. The knowledge of myself is the experience of that thunder. Happiness is not an object of knowledge like a ball of lightning. Let me see if I can use another example. It's like light and dark. So when I go into the kitchen, there is a light switch which turns the light on. The Inherent substratum background is darkness, isn't it? The light switch, the light comes off. I don't have a switch to turn the darkness off before I turn the light on. Darkness is not a thing, it's the absence of. Now, it's very interesting. What does the word Krishna mean? What's the literal translation of Krishna? Dark. Dark. So, here we can say the Prakash, the light, is the jonesing extroverted mind, which is so painful. I go, what? Turn it off. And what's left? Chidananda My nature is listless. It's 
that make it a little clearer? Next verse. As other qualities also are different from one another, like knowledge and pleasure, they cannot be produced at the same time. If it be contended that the knowledge of the qualities is nothing but their coming in contact with one and the same self, we say, no, for they are qualified by knowledge. Seeing things that are objective. I, I just, I don't, I don't know what it means by it. I'm sorry. Let's move on. Gyani neva vishish vishish vajja vishish vajja gyana pyatvam smritis tatha sukham gyatam mayetve mayetyevam Pleasure, etc., are surely objects of knowledge because they are qualified by it. And also on account of the memory, pleasure was known by me. Moreover, they cannot be known by being connected only with the self and not with knowledge. For the self is non-conscious as it is different from knowledge according to you. I think this must be an objector who's talking right here. What I want to do is let's quit a little bit early and I'm going to spend a little bit of time studying this whole section of verses and see if I can be a little bit clearer in being able to pull them apart. So we'll quit just a bit early today. What numbers are we on? Um, that one was 53. Okay. Or sorry, 54. 54. Now I'll do a little study on it. Okay. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Kyo Namaha Hari Om